A billionaire details a world on the brink of disorder. Would you like to know what's likely to happen over the next 18 months? Billionaire investor Ray Dalio has given us a pretty good glimpse into his new report outlining the world on the brink of disorder. And it's pretty easy when looking around to see that the world, once mostly peaceful, civil, and orderly, it seems to be over and protests, riots, wars, and outright disorder is back. It's clear that the world we're going into is not the same as the world we're leaving behind. Ray Dalio has done some amazing research into these subjects in his books, which I've discussed before, and he's recently written an update to where we are right now and what he sees happening over the next 18 months. In this video, I'm going to break down the highlights of his report. I'm going to lay out the big five forces that he explains that we must watch if we want to navigate this changing world correctly. I'm going to lay them out. I'm going to give you my commentary of what's going to happen happen, what we should do to prepare, and how we protect ourselves and profit. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss. Of course, I make these videos to change the way you think about money. Almost everything you've learned is wrong. It was not taught to you correctly. It was potentially left out, but that's okay. We're going to make up for it. We're all going to survive. We're all going to thrive through this because we're working together. I'm going to break this down for you. We're going to learn from some of the greats like Ray Dalio. For myself personally, I'm a global macro investor, right? I've been reporting on, I've been betting on what's going to happen for about the last 15 years. It's been my full-time job on a macro, global macro stage. But because my lens and my viewpoints into what's happening really haven't been that long, about 15 years I've really been studying this. I've learned that I need to go back. I need to go way, way back. I need to study history to understand what's going on and what's likely to happen. Now, after living through the 2008 great financial crash, getting smashed like millions of other Americans and, and others around the world, it was really my wake up call that made me realize that I better figure this out if I wanted to build my wealth back up and more importantly, make sure I never ended up in this situation again. In the recent research and in the study that I've done, I learned about wealth transfers, which are phenomenons, just like in 2008, where most people lose massive amounts of wealth and it gets funneled to the few rich at the top. And we've seen this happen again and again and again in different size transfers in different ways. And we certainly saw this in the 2020, you know, pandemic situation as well. Now, seeing what was going on during the pandemic, it gave me new data, it gave me new data sets to go study and to go back into history and, and take a look at it. Now, I released a three part series, many other videos about the three revolutionary cycles that are all converging right now at the same time. We'll link to those videos, the playlist down below if you want to go catch up on this. I highly recommend it if you want to know where we're going. But to recap you, the three cycles are one, the 250 year political revolution cycle, two, the 80 year financial revolution cycle, and three is the 50 year technological revolution cycle. So all three different cycles on three different time frames, all three converging right now. If you want to watch those videos and and the playlist around those, I'll link to it in the notes down below. Now we can see pretty clearly that they're all converging or they're resetting at the exact same time. So for example, 250 years ago, we saw the US and the French revolutions and we've uh, seen what's going on in France right now. These protests that are happening right now have been gaining steam since like 2016 and they look like they're going to come to a head probably before the end of the decade, most likely my guess by 2025 or better. We'll come back to that date later. Now we could throw the the U.S. into the mix as well. As you can see, tensions in the political realm in the U.S. have never been tighter. Now, one of the most recent and one of the most well-researched writers in this field today is, of course, as I mentioned already, the famous investor and billionaire Ray Dalio. Now, he's written uh, several books, which I recommend. They've opened my eyes up to a lot of this, including his book, which was Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order. I've done a video on this before. You can go back on my channel and find it. We'll try and link it down in the show notes down below as well. If you don't want to read the book, you can watch the video. However, it's a great book, lots of data. But inside this book, he talks about five big forces that affect each other and they change in ways to create what he calls the big cycle. And right? that's what he calls it. Now that produces big changes in the world order. And he tells us that if we understand and follow each of these forces and, and how they interact, then we should be able to understand almost everything that's changing the world order right now. Sound good? Do you want to understand? <laughs> All right, let's dig in. Let's see what he's seen and what we can learn from this. Where are we now and where are we most likely going? Now, per Ray Dalio, big force number one is the financial or the economic force. Of course, I call this the 
uh, financial revolution cycle. Now, in the United States, we're now in the middle part of what he calls the short-term debt cycle. It's also known as the business cycle. Now, these short-term debt cycles last about seven years on average, give or take about three years. Just real quick side note, when we look at these cycles, my research on cycles, his research on cycles doesn't happen on an exact date, time, minute, hour, et cetera. It's like more or less. It's like uh, spring comes you know, on a certain day on the calendar, but the weather doesn't necessarily change right at that time. When we're talking about the bigger cycles, the typically the longer time frame. So we have pendulums that swing 250 years. So it could be 20 years, 30 years in that top section, back to seven years, give or take about three years. There've been about 12 and a half of them since the new monetary world order started in 1945. So we're now about halfway through the 13th of the cycles. And at the point of the cycle where the central bank has tightened money to fight inflation, that's just before the debt and economic contractions, which will most likely come over the next 18 months. Now, Dallas, says that we're in the late and the dangerous part of the long-term debt cycle because the levels of debt assets and debt liabilities have become so high that it's difficult to give lender creditors a high enough interest rate relative to the inflation amount that they're seeing. It's hard to give them that because we need to give them that enough that's adequate to make them want to hold this debt as an asset without making interest rates so high that it unacceptably hurts the borrower debtor. Now, because of unsustainable debt growth, we're likely approaching a major inflection point that will change the financial order. Said differently, it appears to me likely that we're approaching a debt financial economic restructuring that's going to lead to big changes in the financial order. Now, more specifically, Dalio says that it's because of the large deficits that the U.S. Treasury will have to sell a lot of debt. And he's says that it appears there will not be adequate demand for it. Now, if that happens, it's going to lead to either much higher interest rates or the Fed printing a lot of money and buying bonds, which is, of course, going to devalue money further. Now, for these reasons, the debt financial conditions could worsen, perhaps very significantly over the next 18 months. So let's see here. Let's do some math. Ray said that, let's see, I talk about 80-year financial revolution. Ray said that it started in 1945. So let's see, 1945 plus 80 years puts us at uh, two 2025. Yep. Right in line with my 80 year financial revolution cycle. Back to Dalio's big five factors. Big force number two is the domestic order force, or as I call it, the political revolution cycle. Now in several countries, most importantly in the United States, we've seen a growing percentage of the population that are populist extremists. About 20 to 25% of the right are extreme, about 10 to 15% of the left are. Now he says that we have a shrinking of the percentage of the population that are bipartisan, the ones that are in the middle. He says that though the bipartisan moderates still remain in the majority, they constitute a declining percentage of the population and they're far less willing to fight and win at all costs. It's the extremists on either side, the irate minority. Now in studying history, I saw this growing populism of both sides and increased conflict has repeatedly occurred when large gaps in wealth and values exist at the same time, of course, as bad economic conditions. Large gaps in wealth, of course, that's the fiat money system, the debt, the inflation. Values, okay, so we've destroyed all values. There's no such thing as truth. You can be whatever you want. Boys could be girls. And bad economic conditions, low growth, recession, etc. Hmm. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Now, Ray said that looking ahead, the next 18 months will be an increasingly intense big election period, which will lead to a much greater political conflict, which is likely to sharpen the divide between the left and the right. 33 Senate seats, the presidency and control of the House are going to be fought over by a number of populist candidates, and there will be likely be poor economic conditions. So the fights going to be vicious. There's going to be a real test of rule following and compromising, both of which are required to make democracies work. Now back to Dalio's big five factors. Big force number three is the international world order force, which is still part of my political revolution cycle. Now Dalio states that the conflicts between the US and China are likely to intensify as domestic political tensions will likely lead to increased aggressiveness toward China. Now that's because in the US, most everyone is anti-China and those running for office are going to want to get China out. They're going to want to bash each other in an election year. China in the U.S., 
they're already dangerously close to some form of war, whether it's an all out economic one or worse, a military one, I would say we're probably already in an information and economic war. Now, there's several issues that could potentially spike this. We have, of course, Taiwan. We have the chips deals. Obviously, we got dealing with Russia sanctioning investments that are being fought over. Both sides seem to be preparing for war right now. And a note here just about Dalio, he isn't outright saying that we're destined for war. What he is saying is that the odds of some form of a major conflict are dangerously high. Now back to Dalio's big forces. Big force number four is an act of nature. Now Dalio talks about acts of nature. He talks about climate change. I don't really agree with him on this one and he didn't really list out much here. But one thing is for sure is that the developed world wants to reduce energy and the developing world wants and needs a whole lot more energy. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this tug of war plays out. For me personally, I'm a big fan of human flourishment. <laughs> so I want to see the developing world get more energy energy to end the apocalyptic world that they already live in today. Now, finally, big force number five is technology, which of course fits into my 50 year technological revolution cycle. Dalio says that what we can expect from technology and human inventiveness is hard to know exactly, right? We don't know exactly the future, though there should be no doubt that generative AI and other technological advances have the potential to cause both massive productivity gains and massive destruction. Of course, depending on how they're used, the one thing that we can be sure of is that these changes are going to be greatly disruptive. Now, in my opinion and in my research, you see that it's always technology that changes the world. It changes the world more than anything else because it changes the way that we work, we organize, the way we communicate and more. Now, because while it's uh, probabilistically unrealistic to believe that we can materially change the course of events, what we can do is to understand them and we can position ourselves to profit from them being on the receiving end of the wealth transfers and not on the giving end <laughs> like I was in 2008. Now, I vowed to myself, I I vowed to my family to never be on the giving end ever again, which is why I've studied this for over a dozen years now. How exactly do we do that? Well, one, optionality beats uncertainty. Look, the world is going into disorder. It's the opposite of order. It's disorder. What should we do? Well, we don't really know. It's going into disorder. So it's uncertain. Which country will be the best? Which country will have lockdowns? Which country will end meat? Which country will put CBDCs? We don't know. So how do we handle the uncertainty? Well, with optionality. The more options we can have, the better. So I have houses in multiple states. I have houses in multiple countries. Um, I have reserves saved up. I'm able to make money from anywhere in the world. I have lots of options. All right, number two, we want to become sovereign in our own life. To me, sovereignty means being able to direct my life as I see fit, in a way that leads to my own ends, free of coercion. If you were told to take the jab or lose your job, that's coercion, right? They couldn't tell me that. I don't have a job. <laughs> so it becomes sovereign in your own life. How do you do that? Well, the more ways that you can do that, the better. Of course, it's a spectrum. As a matter of fact, I have a quiz uh, if you'd like to take to figure out where you're at on your sovereign path and what you should do. I'll put a link to it down below. It's just free. You can go answer like six questions and it spits that out for you. If you want to know ways that you can improve the sovereignty of your life, go check that out. And then finally, three, invest in technology of the future and wait. So some of this is about being prepared. Some of it is preparing myself first, like putting the oxygen mask on yourself first and then go help others. We want to invest in the technology of the future. We want to wait. So these are the new technologies. This is Bitcoin. This is, like I said, the decentralized monetary and communication networks. It's AI. We want to invest into that. We will allow that to wait. We want to take the time. And that's how we do that. Now, those are my three options. Anyway, what do you think? Let me know. I'd love to hear your comments down below. Is Ray Dalio right? Are we going into a world of disorder? And what are you doing to prepare for it? Check out the quiz. I check out more videos, the playlist down in the comments down below, or I'm sorry, in the description down below. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. As always, thumbs up if you like the video. And if you don't, you can give me a thumbs down. That's okay. But at least tell me why in the comments. Of course, subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Share this video with somebody you think that could uh, use it, benefit from it. And that's what I got to your success. I'm out.